You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. Wayne Frederick was first and foremost a surgeon. As a child born with sickle cell in Trinidad, his mother was a nurse, and because of the disease afflicted in him, the child accompanied her on the rounds and read books omnivorously. The result was that he graduated from high school at age 14, was accepted by Howard University at age 16 into a joint BS MD program, and had completed requirements when he was 22 years old. Dr. Frederick was awarded and completed two fellowships at the University of Texas, MB Anderson, and then joined the University of Connecticut as Associate Director of the Cancer Center. He was recruited back to his alma mater and served as Associate Dean of Medicine, Division Chief of the Department of Surgery, Director of Howard's Cancer Center, Deputy Provost, Provost, and then accepted appointment as President and the Charles R. Drew Professor of Surgery in 2014. It speaks to his youth that even after serving for nearly seven years as Howard's president, Dr. Frederick only recently celebrated his 50th birthday at a time when most college and university presidents were in their mid to late 60s. Of late, he has had the duty of accepting very large gifts of money donated to Howard University, and yet he still manages to look none the worse for wear. Welcome, Dr. Frederick, to Innovators. Thanks for having me. By what standards do you seek to have Howard judged in comparison with other HBCUs uh, relative to universities with large enrollments of students who are first-generation college attendees and persons of color? Do you want the institution to be judged by the university it was, say, 50 years ago, in terms of the success and prominence of alumni? And right now, you have a pretty prominent alumnus. How about the quality and quantity of research? Is that the indicator you want to look at? And would it be graduates who go on to earn graduate degrees? You've been at this now seven years. And what are the benchmarks you use to judge progress? Yeah, you know, I I think when when it comes to judging the university and especially having folks outside look at them and I think of being on the inside, what, what I'm measuring, it's really, uh, are we fulfilling our mission? And our mission, quite simply, is to provide an opportunity to those who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that's embodied in our motto of truth and service. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, we want to bring young people here who probably couldn't go to any other university anywhere, just like myself, and have the kind of experience that um, I had, we want him to have that experience and to probably be placed somewhere way beyond what they themselves would have thought of. And, and so I think that that's important. But to do that, we want to be judged by any standard. I tell people every yardstick sometimes doesn't have the same number of feet in it. And uh, I don't care you know, what the yardstick has in it, but um, I think if we're excellent, uh, you can bring any yardstick and we'll measure well. And I think that that's what we want to be be doing and want to be looking at. We're, we're a very complex organization yes. Yes. In, in high ed landscape. We have the only dental school in DC. We have a hospital, a radio station, TV station. I mean, the assets mm-hmm. that we have make us fairly complicated. And so as a result, I think if you look across American higher ed, there are few institutions that have few. similar assets and complexity. So we, in all those arenas you mentioned, whether it's research, graduate and professional student placement, we really intend to be excellent in all of those arenas. You mentioned something that I, I think when we first started working at Howard, one of the things that came across to us very early was for an institution of about 10 or 11,000 students, it had a range of programs, probably there may be a few pr- other privates that have something like yours, but by and large, they're larger. So it's not only a complex organization, that mission imbues it with something that strikes us as, is quite fascinating at a time when institutions tend to be measured 
less by outcomes and more by inputs. And you seem to flip that over in a way that whatever students bring to you, you take them and take them and you take them where they can be. And you do so in an institution that is, as you mentioned, extraordinarily complicated. Yeah, we were very focused on that. It, it, uh, and, and I think you, you make a good point. Um, education still, I think, is a contract with which America's opportunity is written with. There's no, or written on. There's no doubt about it. Um, education is that economic escalator of our time. What I try to tell people is that I see Howard as an inkwell. And so regardless of what you come, what line on that sheet of that mm-hmm. contract you're going to occupy, you know, we're going to supply you with the ink to get there. And it's extremely important that we keep that focus that while we look at the collective, I think what we try to differentiate is that we give a very personalized touch mm-hmm. to what is occurring, uh, you know, at any given time for any group of students who come here. And you probably couldn't do that and be a 22,000 student institution. Yeah. You know, today, no, um, maybe 10, 20 years down the road, maybe that's exactly what we become mm-hmm. because we get exactly. more efficient at doing it. We, we have more resources that, that make it, you know, more efficient as long as we don't lose the quality. You mentioned your mission, and I, I'd like to talk a bit about it. You started with the mission of educating former slaves in 1867. Mm -hmm. And now you've educated the vice president of the United States. At one time, I think I recall, Howard's chemistry department was ranked in the top 10 in the United States. Mm -hmm. Howard was among the first American institutions to enroll regularly international students, including persons from the Caribbean, such as yourself, North Africa, and from virtually every American state. It's medical students, I think, still make up the plurality of black physicians in America. That's correct. So it's difficult for even the most cynical observer not to be impressed by the impact Howard University has made in American history and culture. So I wanna project you out a little further in time. It's 2035, what will be the story you would like to have told about the university during the period from 2015, which is about a year after you started, until 2035, a period that includes, as I noted, some, some of your tenure as president. Whatever that story is that you're going to tell me, what are the factors that made it come about? That's a, that's a great question. I, you know, I think, especially if you look at our history, a lot of times your history portends your future. Exactly. And at critical times in American history, Howard University has been at the forefront of solutions, finding solutions, supplying solutions, or supplying people with solutions. So you look at the desegregation of American schools, mm-hmm. wrong versus the Board of Education, argued by lawyers on this campus, mm-hmm. uh, some of the mock debates they prepared for their Supreme Court case for Wong versus the board um, right here on this campus. Mm-hmm. And so we've been there, right? We've been at that intersection where, you know, we can give you that solution. So, and America isn't perfect, it hasn't been, especially for African-Americans, but we still hold this promise, right? Along with the difficulties and the pain that it may bring. And so when I look uh, to a 2035, um, what I see is, an American history that is deeply influenced by a Howard University mm-hmm. is what I see. I am optimistic that there are lots of things that we haven't gotten right so far as a country that we will. And as we do get those things right, I do think you will see Howard as an institution, but more importantly, the products of Howard and its alum providing those solutions. I think Vice President Harris is is one, one example of that. But right now we have about 80,000 living alum mm-hmm. and the vast majority of them are blocking and tackling in our communities, mm-hmm. doing the work that needs to be done. We'll never make it to the front page of the New York Times or, or be, you know, be, be named by the larger populace, but we'll definitely have that impact. And I think that that will only grow over the next you know, decade or so. That's fascinating that you should suggest that 
the next 20 odd years will produce an alumni base that is equivalent to that, which comes from people as diverse at Howard as, as Stokely Carmichael. I mean, it, it's just fascinating to think about that. I, and I recall what J, James Baldwin said about American history. He says, the history of black Americans is the history of America. And it suggests that the future of America may well be the future of Black Americans. So, yeah, I, you know, I think Black America is is not only a microcosm of America, but it's deeply woven into the fabric of America. You can't extricate the two from each other. And I think a lot of times our contemporary culture wars yeah. are an attempt to extricate the two rather exactly. than to see how the fabric works best together. Mm -hmm how to make sure that that meshing is done well and is done in a way that benefits the larger good of the mosaic that, that we're trying to build. And the way that you do that, again, is with people. You can have great ideas, but you have to have great people to do it. And I think we're starting to see a contemporary experience of Howard that does that. You know, So whether it's a Chadwick Boseman with film or a, a VP Kamala Harris or mm -hmm. Charles King you know, mm -hmm. Christopher Williams and Investment Bank and you know, Mark Mason. I mean, there, there are right now uh, contemporary alum who are out there making a difference and doing the blocking and tackling that's necessary to bring about a, a different America. It's fascinating. You know, uh, it seems to me back in one of my terms as a university president, I was asked something similar to what I just asked you. And I said, well, in the final analysis, the litmus test will be whether our graduates think we did anything for them and whether the communities in which they serve also think highly of them. So yeah. your point about outcomes really do matter. I think perhaps except for war times, higher education has um, not been jolted to the extent that COVID-19 pandemic has done what it's done to colleges and universities. And the impact has been almost systemic it cuts across all of higher education, some more so than others. But in any event, I don't know of an institution that has not been touched in some way. And the impact not only has been systemic, it's affected almost everyone on a university or college campus, whether they're a student or prospective student, a staff member, a faculty member, whatever. And the near term future makes it even scarier because we don't know when this pandemic really is going to end or whether it will end. Is this then a lost year? Have we lost something? And will colleges and universities return whenever it, it's, the pandemic is over? Will they return to a pre-pandemic normal or is there going to be a new normal in higher ed? Yeah, you know, I, I, this is something that I've been pondering a lot and maybe unfortunately I have very strong feelings about. We, we would have lost some things, there's no doubt about it. The lack of the social engagement we know is critical to what we do as, as educators, especially for young people finding themselves, you know, um, having that self-actualization. Um, what's as informative about that is not just what you experience, but it's what you get from others, especially your peers. Mm -hmm. And we, there's no doubt we've lost that. You can't go back and get that time. Um, it would have passed us. However, I think your analogy to wartime is very critical because that's how I see this time. Some of the most important generations of Americans have been birthed out of that wartime. We talk about golden generations. Uh, we talk about the baby boomers. They came about as a result of a strike that came before them. And I actually think that we are about to see a very, very important generation of Americans mm -hmm. at a very critical time birthed out of a suffering that connected us like no, nothing else has. Nothing else us. has. You know, sometimes you look at war and you say to a certain extent if the country is at war, everybody's at war, but almost every time that we've been at war, there have been winners and losers mm -hmm. to some extent. There have been people who you know, didn't participate at all, didn't have anybody involved, that type of thing. This pandemic has engaged us all. 
it has forced us, even those with assets, to understand the interconnectedness of how milk and butter gets to our table, mm -hmm. of how gas gets into our cars. Mm -hmm. All of the things that we may see as either luxuries or, or comforts, we recognize that those comforts are connected to so many other people that we would never meet that we probably looked past. None of us, I think, unless you're very callous, goes to the grocery store today and doesn't look at the cashier with some level of deep, deep appreciation we didn't have. Exactly. And so I think young people today are going to come out of this with that in mind. Their sensibilities about the humanity of each other is going to be very different from almost any generation in a way that I think is going to make them very great Americans. It strikes me that when we have a 12 or 13 year old young lady from Scandinavia who's decided to fight pollution in the world mm -hmm. and believes that she can do it. That's shared by a group of a generation that I think is probably in their 20s now, from way around their 20s, who actually believe that almost any of the problems we talk about can somehow be affected by them, either by the way they, they choose to live their life but also by the, four, the relationships they form with others. So your point's well taken. I once talked to someone who, who during the Second World War grew a victory garden. And I asked the individual, because he had not served in the military at all, he yeah. said, oh, yes, I did. And I said, no, I, I think you told me you, you were not in the military. He said, oh, I wasn't. But I grew the, the food they ate, so I was in the war. Yeah. And it strikes me that what you just described is that this particular pandemic, given the scope of it uh -huh. and its duration, no one has escaped it. And the question becomes, who will come out of this with a sense of, I can do things that I didn't think I could do, and who will come out just ready to be passive? So I, I, I think you're right, and I hope you're right. I want to follow up just on one point here. We said that every part of higher education has been touched by the COVID. Are there some sectors of higher ed that are really going to be strained? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of higher ed will still be strained because we are gonna have to battle still with some of the pre-pandemic issues around people's perception of That's higher true. ed. Are these ivory towers? Uh, do we belong? Are uh, too many of these campuses too liberal? Is there space for critical debate? Are there spaces that can put conservatives and um, liberals together? So those issues are not going to go away. Some of the tactical issues around online education, how we deliver, those types of things are being answered right now. And one of the things that's coming back is some of the doom and gloom that we were forecasting um, about residential campuses, we recognize is just not the case. Um, young people want to get together. They may want to get together differently. Mm -hmm. We may bring people to campus and still have them take classes online mm -hmm. because the social aspect of the communal activity that they participate in is still part of the magic of our universities. You know, I, I tell students and parents at orientation, you will get what you need to get from us 20% of the time, 10 to 20% of it will occur in a classroom. The rest of it is really gonna occur because you are gonna be willing to talk to the person down the hall in your residence hall. You're gonna go to lunch um, with a group of people who are crazy about some esoteric thing that you've never heard about. And all of a sudden that bug would bite you as well. Uh, and that's where the magic happens. And I think what we have to think of is how do we reframe the activities that take place on our campus yes. that encourage critical thinking, debate, that socialization in a way that continues to grow the young people more, I would say more purposefully as opposed to the, quite a bit of the accident that happens yeah. now. It's interesting, uh, the, the most poignant quote I think I've heard during this whole period was a young woman who was about, she just graduated from college, I think in New York City. And they asked her, what is it you miss most? And she didn't say family. She didn't say job. She said friends. Mm -hmm. I miss my friends. And I thought, well, 22, 23, that probably makes a lot of sense. 
And it also says something about humanity that in a time like this, we just want to be with somebody we care about. That's a good point. I want to change the subject a little bit and talk more about the academic presidency. You've been at this a while. And it's common these days in higher education to talk about, and I've actually written and talked about it, that we're going to have this exodus of university presidents, mainly because they're old codgers like me who been at it for a long time. They've gone through the meltdown of 2009. They've gone through COVID now. They've gone through everything and they're just tired and they're ready just to go away. And there's this sense that there's going to be this limbing like exodus of presidents. And you, by contrast, you, notwithstanding the, the, weir the, the weariness, I know you have to feel at times, you're a relatively young man. So departure from an academic presidency, that doesn't seem likely to come to, for you anytime soon. Sorry, if you were planning on you know, joining the military or whatever, give it up. It's not going to happen. I know you teach a graduate course in education, and I think you focus on college. And so who are these people who are going to take these jobs yeah. in the future? Where are they going to come from? Are they going to be like you, somebody who's been most accomplished in your case as a, as a physician and so forth? Who are these people? Why will they take these jobs, which however much the public may scream about a president making this much money, in the end, they don't get paid very much by the hour. Right. Where are these people going to come from and why are they going to want to do this? Yeah, so actually, um, the reason I teach that course is to try to answer that question. I actually teach a, a, a course called the presidency in uh -huh. our doctoral program Excellent. called higher education leadership program. Great. Um, and I was talking to the Dean and, you know, about this, um, she has a, a professor who was really determined to bring this about. And so they went about building a um, course, we call it helps is the acronym, but it was to try to actually be purposeful about feeding the pipelines. So these young oh. people want to be in administration. They specifically have an mm -hmm. in, uh, affinity for HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And so the goal here was to prepare them to either be VPs and hopefully provost and presidents, mm -hmm. uh, but to be purposeful about that, to put them mm -hmm. through a mm -hmm. higher education leadership program does that. So for my course on the presidency, for instance, I'm pretty open with them about the, the trials and tribulations mm -hmm. of the job. I also am able to give them real time feedback yes. about either a crisis or a victory that's occurring and give them the anatomy of that, the anatomy of a gift. I'll help them understand where the cultivation starts. And that sometimes when people hear an announcement, they think, oh, this this kind of happened by chance. And you know, all of those things I think are I think are critical issues. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say as well, and I think it's a very good question for all of us in higher ed, because I worry about it. I don't think that these jobs should be done by, or, or sh the, the preparation for these jobs mm -hmm. should continue in the way they have in the past. That ah. you excel in one way in academia and you get mm -hmm. promoted and then you have a personality more than a skill set mm -hmm. that people then identify with the presidency. I think we have to be more purposeful about the preparation at all levels. And so we do that at Howard now. We have a cheerleadership mm -hmm. academy where we're putting chairs, new chairs, mm -hmm. prospective chairs to associate deans through a system where they, a curriculum for a year or two, where they learn about budgeting, mm -hmm. they learn about managing conflict. I mean, all the things that we mm -hmm. all know that we don't learn of, <laughs> about purposefully. Yeah, and I, and I think if we continue to do that, we really will create a significant cadre. I think we're now into our fourth cohort mm -hmm. in that program. And they're probably averaging somewhere between 10 and 20 students. So mm -hmm. you think about it, you do that well over That's the amazing. next decade or yes. two. And at least we'd have some candidates ready exactly. to go. You know, I was always reminded there aren't many kids who at the age of 11 say, I want to grow up and be a university president. So yeah. uh, exactly. and if they do, I wonder what's, what, what's wrong with your life. <laughs> exactly. One last question. In the past year, a bunch of wealthy individuals and foundations have made very sizable donations to HBCUs. And Howard has certainly benefited from the philanthropy. 
And in fact, if we go back, the history of high, American higher education is replete in some ways with individuals who, for whatever reason, made significant donations, significant enough that literally they started an institution. Mm -hmm. The best example of that, of course, is Leland Stanford. Uh, most mm -hmm. people think Stanford's been around since the 19th century. Stanford's a very young institution. Phil Knight, uh, what he did for the University of Texas system, literally, I mean, just huge sums of money. Princeton has gotten lots of money from Jeff Bezos and Meg Whitman. George Eastman made huge donations to MIT. Moreover, and this is the dark side of this, I think, this has come about in part because of the profound inequity in wealth, not just in the United States, but around the globe. We've never, at least in modern times, we have never had such an inequity that individuals could amass the kinds of fortunes they do now. And that means that Michael Bloomberg can give $1.8 billion dollars to Johns Hopkins for the School of Public Health. Michael Dell and what he's done at the University of Texas Medical School, for example. I'm just curious, and I hope and I suspect that it sometimes in the dark of night when you've had a particularly tough day and you're wondering, well, gee, if I could just get one biggie. Let's just imagine, because it's not a hypothetical thing. It's quite plausible now that an individual can give away billions of dollars. If Howard were to receive a gift of such size, a billion dollars, we'll just use that number, and it's unrestricted, there are no ties to it, there are no strings attached, what would you use such a gift for? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I think there are three fundamental things I would use it for. We have the highest graduation rate for Pell Grant students at a private institution mm -hmm. that have greater than a certain percentage of Pell Grant students. Mm -hmm. We have 46% Pell Grant students. Mm -hmm. And there are only four institutions in the country that have higher success, I think, with those students. Mm -hmm. They're all public institutions in the California system. Yes. I would immediately put a significant amount of that money into an endowment that would allow those students mm -hmm. to go through our undergrad campus debt-free. That, that's one of my utopias, because I think what we do for Pell Grant students in terms of sending them to med school, to law school, mm -hmm. yes. uh, to Wall Street is absolutely incredible. And is ultimately, I think, if you ever want to have an answer for why higher education exists, you see one of those students with an yeah. expected family contribution of zero on graduation day and then five years later, and you look at them when they came as freshmen and you understand what you've done, not just for them, but for their family and generations to come potentially. So that's the first thing that I would do. Mm -hmm. Second thing that I would do is to really ensure the professoriate has an opportunity to compete pretty aggressively in the arenas of scholarship mm -hmm. and research mm -hmm. with a little more risk taking my faculty and researchers are very, very passionate about solving for the big problems in the world. So right now we're trying to build a social innovation hub where I want to restore where social sciences and humanities sit, mm -hmm. wrap it with data science and technology, yes. and have them go after the big problems of the day, income inequality, mm -hmm. criminal justice reform. The problem that exists today is that those areas are A, hard to solve for, B, hard to commercialize that activity, Yes. And C, um, do not get the type of philanthropic support at our universities in particular. Mm -hmm. You're far more likely to see support at an NGO when I think the solutions are right here on this campus. And that would be the second thing that I would certainly go after. And it's only a billion, but replacing this physical <laughs> plant. I'm going to remind you someday that you <laughs> said <laughs> only a billion. <laughs> yeah. Replacing this physical plant is also important. Yeah. Um, the reason why space is important as well, because you have to remember these young people are coming from, in some cases, some very tough circumstances. Yes. And one of the things that I think enhancing the spaces that these students get educated in is important is to get them, it's all part of what gives them their self-actualization and self-appreciation. 
by putting them in spaces that are modern and, and looking to the future. So they see themselves and also have a better appreciation for their self worth that we see it fit to treat them with that level of, you know, grace and dignity um, that they're deserving of being in world-class spaces so that that ideation that they take place, we want that ideation to be as free and as purposeful and as rich. You've been most helpful. It's a long day and you've taken time out to, to talk with us today. I, I, I come away from this way. I always come away from conversations with you about how much you are committed, not just to Howard, but to the notion of education as if not, not just a, but the vehicle for social and economic mobility. And that passion has not dimmed in the years I've known you. And I'm hoping it doesn't dim anytime soon. Well, it's a pleasure as always. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again in another occasion. And it, hopefully at that point, we'll be able to sit across the table from one another. Absolutely. Same thing here. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, it. sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.